Okay. So yeah, like Sydney said, my name is Donny. Uh, the slide says I build iOS apps, and apparently I also do the first talk in the first ever Swift user group uh, in the Netherlands, so that's pretty cool. Last year I wrote a book on iOS 10 programming, uh, and this year I'm doing the follow-up one on iOS 11 programming. So if you're starting with iOS, uh, looking for some extra information on everything that iOS has to offer, uh, pick up a copy. Uh, and today I would like to talk about JSON and Swift. So I would like to see a bunch of hands up for people who use JSON and Swift. Probably everybody. And who thought it, keep your hands up, come on. <laughs> and who thought it was a good experience? Like who liked it up until Swift 4? A lot of hands go down. You keep it up. You use the framework probably or a library. I have my own libraries. So. Put your hands down if you use libraries. <laughs> exactly. I don't think any you did. You're the weird one. <laughs> Me neither, actually, to be honest. But it's actually not that good of an experience, but like the title says, it's still a better love story than Twilight. But it's a quite terrible one. Um, so, the topics for today. I would like to speak a little bit about uh, handling JSON before Swift 4. And then I just want to talk about a few of the things that I learned about it so far. And then we're going to see how Swift 4 changes the handling of JSON uh, and some of the remarks that I would like to leave you with for the end, because I personally don't think that even Swift 4 isn't perfect uh, in terms of JSON handling. So let's say we have the following JSON file. It's a very simple one. Uh, it's an array with a single item in it. And then if you wrote Swift 1.0, who wrote Swift 1.0 code here? Okay, then this should look familiar. <laughs> I think this was the worst thing we all ever wrote. Just a huge pyramid of if lets. And then of course Swift 1.2 I think made that a little bit better, but then in Swift 2, uh, it actually was, I think it's okay, right? I mean, we have a guard, we have everything. But then at some point, I think it was even before Swift 2, where I saw a library called Swifty JSON, who, which made the whole thing look a bit like this. Who used Swifty JSON here? Anybody? Okay, cool. Uh, and then probably you were a little bit like me, and you thought it was amazing, and then you used it all the time. But what if you like just scale it up a bit? And I don't mean scaling. Like that, of course, I mean scaling in terms of testing how it performs uh, with a huge file, because that's sort of where I started looking at how Swift really handles JSON, because uh, I had to parse a large JSON file. Uh, it had items that looked like this. This is a single item in it, and it's actually quite a small one. You don't have to read all of it. It's just huge. And I had to use at least 2,080 of those. Why 2,080? It was four times the response that I got from the back end, and I wanted to at least be able to handle four times what I had to handle at the time of building the app. Uh, so these are, they represent events, so just parties that take place somewhere. As you can see, they contain a lot of nested objects, so locations, categories, artists that play there, whatever. And I was testing on an iPhone 5C. Slow, really slow comparing it to an iPhone 7 at least. So I started off with the code that I already had in Swifty JSON, and that code looked a bit like this. I had to cut out half of it, uh, and I wrote this specifically for this talk. So 2080 events, parsing it like this, doing nothing special, just creating instances of some models, looping through the whole thing. That took about 6.7 seconds. And I don't know about you guys, but 2,000, 3,000 items in a list, it's not that much. It's a lot, but it's not that much. So that's me after realizing 50 JSON is it's not going to cut it at all. So what do I do? Let's see what native Swift has to offer. Code wasn't as pretty anymore. A lot of guards, a lot of unwrapping stuff, a lot of casting stuff. Not a lot of fun to write. But same thing, 1.84 seconds to complete. 
So that's more than three times faster, and especially if you consider an iPhone 5C having to wait for seven seconds almost. It's not going to happen. So Swift 2, it's not the prettiest code to write, but it's fast. Faster than Swift JSON, at least. So what did I learn before Swift 4 came out? First of all, be careful about libraries. They make things easy, but they could also make it really slow. And you can imagine that after I refactored this, I went and took out a bunch of other libraries for convenience, like pure layout, auto layout stuff I can write myself, no more libraries. I'm not sure how much faster the app got, but I'm pretty sure that that didn't make it faster either. But the refactor did make it faster. Uh, sometimes code that's uglier is faster. It's unfortunate, but it's true. I would recommend to write pretty code first, see if it's fast, and then make it ugly. Is that a hand for yeah. coolness, or do you have a question? I wanted to ask you whether you tried also object mapper. I haven't tried it, no. Because that one is also very, very popular in the All right, no, I haven't, uh, I haven't used that one, to be honest. But I would love to hear how it works, because I'm curious. Uh, and actually working with JSON and Swift 2 isn't as bad as it seems. So all the hands that went down, it's really not that bad, actually. So I'm with you, one weird guy who kept his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that's all pre-Swift 4. And we're here to talk about Swift 4. So well, what about it? Um, probably many of you have already seen it, but I'm still going to introduce it to you, the codable protocol. It's actually a combination of two other protocols, encodable and decodable. And it's all about how to either encode or decode uh, data, JSON data, uh, to objects. So again, before Swift 4, you would do something like this. You had a category struct, and then you have to unwrap the things. And you have to cast them to whatever you want it to be. If it's not optional, you can provide a default value uh, if you still want to initialize with, without the JSON value. And then in Swift 4, all you have to do is you add the codable uh, protocol conformance to your object. And in most cases, you're already done. In this case, you're done because integer and string, they both conform to the codable protocol themselves. Because the one precondition that I'm aware of is that anything that's codable, all the properties also have to be codable. Also, to create an instance of your category in this case, you create a JSON decoder, you pass it your JSON data, uh, the call can fail, so try question mark or wrap it in a nice do catch block, of course. And the way that it knows what belongs where is that the property names are directly mapped to your keys in your JSON file. So in this case, we have the ID and the name. The Swift, uh, the JSON file has these properties, so it works out of the box, like magic. So what if these keys do not match? What if they're totally different? Like, imagine this JSON uh, object, where it's a there's a location there. And we have the latitude and the longitude. And uh, well, being lazy developers, we didn't want to write latitude and longitude in our struct, because lat long is enough. This, of course, wouldn't really work. The let and long would always be nil because they don't match anything in the JSON file. So what do you do? You give it a little bit of help. You just define your coding keys, which is a nested enum on your codable object. The coding key uh, is of a type string, and it conforms to the coding key protocol. That's how the decoder knows what to do. If you want to use the default, just list all the default things in a single case, separate them by a comma. But if you want to do something different, like in our case, where latitude should be lat and longitude should be long, you just give it the value of whatever it is in your JSON. This is really useful, mostly in the case where JSON is always snake case, like something underscore something, and Swift is always uh, camel case. You need to map it somehow. This is how you can map that. So my tried refactoring a little bit of, uh, of my app to this, and it's actually not that hard. But then I remembered, when it's easy, like Swifty JSON, let's see how it performs. Is it fast? Is it slow? Well, first of all, the code that I had to write, 
was really easy. In the other one, I had to cut out most of the code because it wouldn't fit the slide. In this case, the full code fits the slide. A lot better already. And it's basically just as fast as the Swift 2.0 stuff because this took only 1.82 seconds. So my opinion on codable performance, I love it. It's fast, it's easy, and it's clean. Uh, and if you do backend Swift, it's also easy to share. I just learned. So one of the things that I did notice is that Codable and Date are not good friends, like at all. I think they kind of dislike each other. Like in this example, it works well. So we have a simple item in JSON. It's just a single property, a date with a struct, DW date. And then I decode it, and to tell it what to do, I can give it a custom date formatter. You can also use the default implementation, which should work for most cases. But if you don't have the option to use the default, just use a date formatter. And decode it, works, you have your DW date object, everything's fine. Now note that the date here is optional, so it can be nil. So if I were to give something invalid to this date, put your hand up if you expect the app to crash. Nobody, right? So this, again, to confirm, should work, right? I mean, we give it an empty string, it's not a date, whatever, it's optional, so it will fail and just be nil. Except it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. You get an error. Data corrupted. The date formatter did, did not know what to do. It couldn't make a date, so we crash, or we at least throw an error. Instead of saying, okay, I couldn't figure it out, let's just return nil, no, error time. Another option you have, if you're really clever, you can give a custom date format code. So you can, if you're really crazy about handling your own dates, you can convert your date yourself instead of giving it a date formatter. But that closure has to return a date. Not an optional date, but a date. So there's no way ever that you're going to give an invalid string and make it nil, unless you override the default implementation for init with decoder. That's so awesome about Codable in Swift 4. Just to let you know, this init from decoder is the sort of a protocol requirement for the decodable protocol. Uh, and you get it for free by default. But if you have a date that needs to be optional and to be able to handle invalid JSON, you have to override it. Nothing you can do, at least not that I know. So you get a container, which is a keyed container. That, that means that it's basically a dictionary that uses the coding keys defined in your object. So you saw the coding keys before. By default, they match the property names of your struct. If you override it, give it custom names, then that's what it uses. And then the funny thing is, you can do try container decode date self for key date. So what it does, decode whatever is in the key path for date, which is the word date in this case, decode it into a date, and if it fails, just make it nil, because try question mark. The default implementation that I'm aware of looks basically the same, except there's no question mark between try, after try. So if that would change, then suddenly you do have an optional date that's truly optional. So what else should you know? One thing that's a lot of uh, fun is that you can nest uh, enums, for instance, or structs or whatever, just like you normally would do, and it will just work. So in this case, you have a price that can be either a ticket or a voucher. And in the JSON, it's type one, which is the raw value for it. And you have an enum, which is an int, and codable, of course. Uh, and the ticket is one, voucher equals two. And it will just work. So this will just give you a price where the name is whatever the name is. And the type is uh, your internal enum type instead of an integer. That's quite nice. It's also nice to know that it also works the reverse way. So from any object you have, even if it has a nested enum, like our price, you can just set, tell it to be encoded as JSON. And it will come out as JSON at the other end. Could be nice for sending forms or whatever, or posting data. Another thing that's nice to know is that uh, normally you would maybe sort of have the struct events response with a property 
it's an array of events. You use that in your uh, decoding code, like the bottom example is. But the example above that is actually the same. Uh, so this response you would have here, it's actually just a string, which is the key events, the word, uh, and an array of event objects. So you don't have to really strictly put everything in structs. You can also use built-in types like arrays and dictionaries because they're both uh, codable. So I'm going to leave it at that with codable. Uh, it's actually a really powerful uh, thing. Some concluding remarks. One thing I really learned is that handling JSON with libraries can be really convenient, but if you don't watch out, it could be really slow, especially with big uh, data sets. And the built-in stuff is actually quite good. Especially Codable Protocol performs really well. It's quite easy to set up, apart from the few caveats that are in there, like the date one. Like I said, it's a bit too strict. I would say that it should be uh, possible to at least have a custom date handling strat strategy that returns nil if you wanted to, but you cannot do that. And also you can do really powerful things with it, like nesting structs, nesting enums, and really converting everything to true Swift objects instead of making it uh, ugly JSON data. If you want to learn a lot more about Codable, uh, I found this uh, blog post or sort of a collection of things you can do with uh, Swift 4 JSON parsing. There's a URL at the bottom. The slides, I think, are going to be on GitHub, so you can get the URL from there. Or you can Google for Ultimate Guide to JSON Parsing with Swift 4. I didn't write it, but it's awesome. And that's it for the talk. <laughs> Any questions? Really, no questions at all. At the beginning, I was wondering, um, because you said uh, something about uh, parsing with Swift 1 and with Swift 3. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be different with Swift 4. Yeah. Were there no differences with Swift 3? Uh, None that were so big that I remember them. Uh, I think most of, the, most of the things were the same, except for I had to refactor a lot from any object. So you had string any object dictionaries to string any. That's the one thing that I recall, but I don't think there were any other major breaking changes in, in that department. Our response is the enum um, decoupling. Can you have an enum with, uh, with other objects in it, or only string and ints? What happens then? I'm not sure. I think it has to be pretty simple, but I'm not 100% sure on it. I haven't tried it to do a lot of complex stuff. They support any raw type that's supported by the by Swift, so it can contain ints, in sixteen, booleans, mm -hmm. every raw type, okay. whatever it is. Cool. Well, there's the answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I have a question. Can you can you override the date um, the decoder? The date decoder. Yeah, just an example that what you want to do, but you can't. Uh, so can you override the date decoder? You can provide a custom uh, date handling strategy. So in the example, I used a date formatter. But you can also say, like, no, date formatters are not good enough for me for some reason. I have a really crazy date string. I implement my own one. That's fine, except the, the closure that you give uh, to the JSON decoder, it has to return a date and not an optional date. Oh, right. So to make it optional... Exactly. So you need to, to, to really override the whole implementation of the, uh, the initialize with decoder. Okay. And then can, you, can you do that for other types as well? So you can... Yeah. You, if, if you have a, a, some crazy thing where you sort of have a, a nested JSON file that you want to flatten, for instance, yeah. you can also override the, the initializer for the decodable yeah. uh, and do everything in there. So if you work with like a super annoying API, you could just override the Exactly. Yeah. Decoders. Yeah. Yeah, so you can really bend the API to your will, That's, which is quite nice. You, you, you showed that the, the date uh, formatter, it crashed, or it, it gave an error. Yeah. But you cannot handle that with a catch. You can handle it with a catch, but let's say you have an array of those 2,080 events that I had, uh -huh. uh, and you want to decode them. Mm -hmm. If one of them has a missing date, none of the 2,080 are decoded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you handle it locally? Uh, no, you really have to, to implement the custom initializer. Okay. It just doesn't know how to initialize. Wow. Actually, can't you, can you 
could split up the uh, yeah, you could split up the JSON into separate array, uh, area, separate entities inside the array, and then you go through them one by one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mapping. Yeah, you could probably do that, something like they that. Yeah. But then one of them would still fail. But yeah, yeah but you would still have 2,079 uh, correct conversions. But still, that one uh, in the catch, you cannot really sort of fall back to anything mm -hmm. unless you sort of do unpack. And at that point, you, you're better off overriding the initializer, I would say. Or well, just save it as a string and then handle the string to the decoding separately. Yeah, but that of course defeats a little bit of the purpose of what codable. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. But if you know your API is inconsistent for whatever reason, uh, that could be a very uh, good option if you don't want to override the initializer. Yeah. Or fight with the API developer. <laughs> yeah, which is never a good idea. <laughs> any more questions? All right. Well, thank you, John. You're very welcome.